Good evening and welcome to today's session on BIC streams, Seeing Sense, a conversation about perfumes in ancient India. Uh, joining us are James McHugh and Shobha Narayan. Uh, before I hand over to Shobha, a few quick instructions for those of you who may be here for the first time and want to sign up to updates from us. You can do so by visiting our website or you can follow us on our social media channels, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. With that, uh, welcome everyone and over to you, Shobha. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, James, for agreeing to do this from California, from Los Angeles. Uh, I have been following James's work before I met him. Um, he has chosen to approach India in perhaps the most sensuous way possible, which is through sense. James McHugh studies the history and religions of early India, working with texts in Sanskrit and related languages. He completed his PhD at Harvard University and now is an associate pr professor at the University of Southern California. His book, Sandalwood and Carrion, Smell in Indian Religion and Culture, is I would say essential reading for anyone interested in aesthetics, scents, perfumes, even food, which is how I got to it. He's currently finishing a book on alcohol, drinking and abstinence in Indian history and religion, tentatively titled An Unholy Brew. James, thank you for joining us. So this session, I will speak a little bit longer than um, I usually do uh, because I'm very excited about it. Um, I will speak for about three minutes as an introduction into the material culture of how perfumery is used in India. And then James will speak, and then we'll have a Q&A. And at the end, uh, as usual, we will have questions from the audience. So please pose your questions in the chat box. And depending on the number of questions, I will finish very quickly or uh, ask James all the questions I want to. A Sufi saint was asked what forgiveness is. And Imam Ali said, it is the fragrance that a flower gives out when it's being crushed. India is a perfumed land. The bounty of its soil gives rise to not just storied perfume ingredients like jasminum sambac, but also philosophies surrounding perfumes. Not just perfumes, the ancient Indian mind connects material objects, the senses, the mind, and the soul in a way that would have Carl Jung nodding approval. I'm a student of psychology and I admire Jung very much. So castes were called colors or varnas. A sense of taste, which is a very tactile sense, textural sense, was linked to enjoyment. We called both of them rasa. And we called many things rasa. Eating delicious food was rasa. Enjoying good music was rasa. And hopefully listening to this lecture will give you rasa. Perfumes were called vasanas. Vasane or smell is something that is a very common word in vernacular. But vasanas are also deeply philosophical. So when an aunt of mine talks about attaining moksha, she says she has to give up all her vasanas, which is the feelings and emotions and the karmas that are layered on the soul and the spirit over not just this lifetime, but many lifetimes. Today, James is going to talk about vasanas in particular, the material world that is linked to them through flowers, trees, twigs, but also the emotional landscape and stories. His book, Sandalwood and Carrion, is an ex excellent primer for this landscape. In it, he talks about the Brihat Samhita, an uh, 16th century text written by a polymath that would have given Da Vinci a run for his money. Varaha Mihira, wrote about clouds, he wrote about timekeeping, he wrote about gemology, and he also wrote about perfumes, about the everyday perfumes that Indians, even today, even in COVID, when I go down in the morning, I see uncles and aunties, as we call them in India, wandering around with their flower baskets, picking the jati or the jasmine, the champaka, the uh, parijata, and then they put it on their ancestors and they put it on their gods. So this is a lived experience in India. And we 
see it in many ways. We see it in Ayurveda, which calls it the Udvartana, where they do the scrubs on us. We call it the Abhyanga, which is the weekly oil bath for the young kids. Um, and we wear flowers every day for beauty and aesthetics. So with that, I'm going to hand this over to James. And after every good perfume, you need a pause. You need to smell the coffee seeds. So every now and then, I will have a pause and I will introduce a little bit, maybe a video or some photographs, which we will show as James talks. I will leave with one um, last thing, which is that recently, um, for the elders in my family, we have been chanting a slokam called, um, it goes like this, Triambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam. It's the Murityunjaya Mantra. And after reading James's work, I realized that the Sugandhim Pushti Vardhanam, anything with Sugandhim is, has good fragrance. And the most surprising thing I, heard, I, I, I found about sense has to do with Mahatma Gandhi. And Raghu, would you share that screen? Um, in, a, in a Sanskrit group that I'm part of, there was a discussion recently about Gandhi and whether his name was Gandhi or Gandhi. And as you see in Gujarati, the word Gandhi means a grocer, but I've heard the word comes from Gandhika, which means a seller of perfumes. So I will leave it to scholars like James to investigate whether Mahatma Gandhi's ancestors were sellers of perfumes. With that, I hand it over to James and look forward to hearing his, his uh, brief words, or as long as you would like. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shobha, and thank you, Raghu, and actually everyone else for helping organize this and everyone to coming. Um, uh, it's a bit early in the morning here for me, but um, I'll try and be lively. Um, I might be sipping my tea as we go. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting you were just saying about COVID and the whole thing with COVID and the sense of smell, and uh, and also with everything being on, you know, Zoom. And I'm 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 just teaching a class about sort of uh, about this kind of Indian cultural history type material. And just the other day we were doing smell, and normally in that class, in the actual class, I hand, I hand out all these jars of stuff. And um, it's really unfortunate that, uh, you know, and the students, have, especially like in, in, uh, in America, a lot of them have never smelled a lot of these things. Uh, and uh, it's just really sad that, you know, Zoom is the most scentless environment in the universe. Um, so, yeah, so um, yeah, we're here to just have a conversation today um, about uh, this work I did, this kind of um, several year project about smell and perfumery in South Asia in a kind of early period up to about 12, 1300, mainly using Sanskrit sources. And, and the limitation there is just the languages I was trained in. And actually somebody, we, we need a big book on say the smell in sort of Tamil sources or something like that on perfumery, that would be a great thing. So there's a lot of work still to do and in later materials as well. And um, yeah, I, I just got fascinated by this because I think it's partly a product when I started studying uh, the region and the culture um, is that often you'd get these, say like an, a book would be like about say Hinduism and it would just be largely about sort of the philosophical systems and really didn't often address, um, you know, what you actually saw in a temple or something like that. And um, I just got a bit intrigued and I actually, what, how did it start? I remember I wrote to um, a, an expert in Ayurveda, uh, Dominic Majestic, whose work is great. And he said, oh, there's these texts on perfumery. There's these books that are just about perfumery. Sometimes it's just a chapter in another book, like with the Brahat Samhita. But there's these other ones where it's just like a whole book, not many, about on perfumery. And I was like, whoa, I've never heard of them in Sanskrit. So I got them out and I just couldn't understand a word of what they said, all these complicated processes for cooking and processing, all these, and if ever if you have ever dealt with lots of herb names, it's, it's a bit of a... Was that the Ganda Shastra, James? Or? Yeah, that's the, uh, that's the uh, Ganda, the, the Gandavada, Gandasara thing. And uh, yeah, and I just got fascinated. And then, but then I sort of, I realized I wanted to do a sort of bit of a comprehensive study of the philosophical understanding of how olfaction works. You know, what smells do in literature? Because, you know, we tend to think, oh, smells, memory, you know, proofs and things like that, which is, that's not what happens with smells in, 
these t contexts and then perfumery and aromatic substances and you know what they mean and even today you, you i'm sure you're aware that like you know you know you don't you don't wear saffron oil on the boiling hot day in june you know what i mean like a, 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 a ito wala will be like no don't put this don't put saffron oil on on a boiling hot day it'll be bad for you so there is this kind of general understanding of things like hot and cold and other properties so i just did this big wide-ranging um, survey and and uh well looking back at it now there's still a lot of work to do it does i'm like there's so many gaps and there's so many things i never really fully explored or went into very deeply um so it's um even though i sort of made a stab at it and, and that was largely based on another scholar we might talk about pk gode um uh, there's tons of work to do there's a lot less, still to be investigated so yeah so we're just going to talk about this today thank you so how did the ancients view um, scents um, in India, James? Because I recall you said at JLF that they saw it as good and bad. So how did the ancient uh, in Indians construe the scent universe? Yeah, well, that's, in, in, if you like, sort of look at uh, more philosophical materials, though it actually permeates into a lot of other areas as well. Um, you get a uh, you frequently see this classification into you know you have these people going how many types of odor are there um and people will say oh there's two types um often you know good smell and bad smell now you do have other classifications floating around with more types they get kind of more complicated but by a certain stage it's pretty common to see uh, you know there are two types of odor good smell and bad smell which is actually a sort of big contrast with um say something like colors or sort of sounds um or, or sort of tactile um qualities um tastes you know plenty of tastes um we know that and uh, but it's interesting that smell is kind of binary and also what was striking about that um it's often binary there's exceptions i'm simplifying here but what's interesting about that is if you think tastes they're like salty sweet sour but like there's no kind of good or bad in there and these are qualities of, you know, in the systems, these are actually quality, you know, there's complicated philosophical systems, but you know, often these are qualities of, you know, the jasmine, the jasmine has the quality um, of, you know, it has earth atoms and these earth atoms have the quality of odor and that odor in this case of something, some type of jasmine um, is good, which um, is kind of really interesting that like, from a sort of philosophical point of view that there's, they're, they're objectively good and bad. It's, and we tend to think of, good and bad aesthetic things is about us. Uh, and also the fact that they're binary, which sort of um, is, makes a nice sort of analogy with sort of, you know, Dharma and Adharma and sort of good and evil and, and things like that. So, uh, you, so you can, you know, it makes a kind of good analogous thing um, uh, for lining up with other binary, other sort of good and bad binaries. And, and, and uh, that's the sort of classification. And then they had like, uh, uh, and like I said, that does creep into things like you see it in medical texts. I think uh, I've seen it in the Mahabharata as well. Um, so it's not just in super philosophical academic things. And then um, they also had a theory that you, you know, how smell worked, which is um, uh, kind of simple, but like sensible that like, you know, earth particles from this, you know, so there's a, there is some jasmine out there in that, but it's too cold, cold. A skunk might walk in if I open the door at this time of day, which will be very smelly. The one went off last night, so this room stinks of skunk as we speak, in fact. And, uh, but it, there's jasmine over there. And if, uh, you know, what the way that works is like, at, you know, particles, atoms from the jasmine are carried to me and touch my, contact my nose, and then I experience them. So, so in that respect, it's, and, and the, the way they get from the jasmine to me is they're carried by the wind. And, and one word for wind is like Gandhawaha, like sort of odor carrier in Sanskrit, common word in fact. And um, yeah, so that's this kind of interesting thing that like vision, for example, it's remote. So you can see something far away without touching it. So I can smell something from far away-ish without touching it um but um at the same time it does involve contact so yeah. that's where it is a kind of remote sense but there are you do also get things like purity regulations about not sinning not smelling impure things because there is an element that it is contact as well 
And, and obviously wind is associated with a sense of touch. So, you know, in a lot of sort of romantic poetry, you know, the wind that has touched my lover's sandal scented body comes and caresses my body and brings me her scent. I think that that sort of a lot of, you're, you're often caressed by the wind that is carrying the fragrance of something in, in poetry, which is, which correlates to the philosophical understanding in fact. So there is sort of consistency there. So I, I will ask you for the theory of olfaction a little bit more, but I, I think it's really curious. I did some research on cows and I found that Krishna has 108 cows and each cow's color was very perfectly classified. This is the color, the gray of the smoke in the morning. So what you say is fascinating that scent does not have that minute classification, um, that color and text, as you pointed out. The the And also the fact that the the name for Vayu is also the, gan the Ganda carrier, and the name for Agni too is the Ganda. Sugandim is a carrier of the nice smelling ghee and other fragrances. So I think, would you say scent is a foundation for many of the other philosophies? I mean, was it, it came early on, so they didn't bother to classify it so much, but it laid the foundation for all the later stuff, the colors, the Varnas and everything. Um, I'm not sure. No, I don't think that necessarily, that it's kind of why like everything else is based on it. Um, what you actually see, like, this is, I can't remember the full details of it right now, but in Mahabharata, you do have this sort of classification of good smell, bad smell, and then sort of fatty smell, sweet smell, and they're a bit sort of taste-based, and oily smell, and things like that. And then that kind of goes away, and then you get these Buddhist classifications in terms of um, where it's coming from. So, like, Fruit smell, flower smell, you know, wood smell, um, rotten meat smell, raw meat smell, and things like that. And uh, but they, they sort of go away after a, a certain point. And um, I mean, in a way, if you're going to start enumerating types of smells in terms of things that have smells, like where do you end? You can end up with a very, very, very long list. Um, or even if you kind of go, well, things that you know, tasty things smell, and you know. It's like we've never been so actually in a way it makes sense and it's it, you know it's, it's something you see in um around in other sort of philosophical systems as well uh, uh you know outside india and other parts of the world that people kind of gave up on trying to have like a limited number of odors like for colors or something because um it was just sort of difficult to do and that's still one of these things that people debate about the ultimate classification of odors, which um, I feel like I'm not as up to speed on. Linnaeus did a classification of odors, which I, odors, yeah. I remember rightly was really interesting. I can't remember the full details of it. It was in Latin. <laughs> and I don't know Latin. I just had to sort of pretend I knew when I was reading that. Has it changed you? This, how, uh, I, this is a tangential question before we go into the scholarly stuff, but being sort of steeped in scent, ha uh, do you smell better these days? What's your, what, how has it changed you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it did. I think it made me pay attention to it more. Um, uh, yeah, I think a lot of people sort of ignore it and they're sort of, they're smelling things all the time. They're doing a lot of sort of smell work all the time. Like they're sort of deodorizing and cleaning themselves up and seeking out certain things, but they just sort of see it as not very important unless they're kind of, perfume nerd or something like that. But a lot of people just kind of don't really do much with it. But I'm sort of more aware of, conscious of how I'm sort of functioning in that kind of environment. And I do sort of seek out good smells. Like I'll sort of plant a good jasmine in the garden, I'll buy some good incense and I'll spend a bit more on it than I would um, probably before. And um, I don't know if I've got actually a better sense of smell for it. I don't, I don't know if I've got like some sort of amazing sense of smell at all. But it's just more like uh, paying attention to it and sort of prioritizing it a bit more. I mean, I think that's that's one of these things. And, and actually, you see, I mean, actually, you probably see, you see that in India, you see that in the Middle East a lot, in fact. But people sort of prioritize kind of good, good incense, good perfumes, um, and just in terms of time and money and just sort of mental attention. Uh, kind of like people, some people do with shoes or something, you know what I mean? Like, but I, I kind of prioritize it a bit more than um, a lot of people would say in America, let's say. So this French perfumer Serge Lutens, who I'm sure you've heard about, told me uh, uh, India and Arabia are the sort of the fountainheads of scent, scent cultures. 
and even to this day i find in both cultures uh, women go to the grocery store and they smell the papayas or the pomegranates and then they figure out if, if it's ripe enough and uh, um uh, so now back to the scholarly stuff i will dip back into your how it has changed you but i was fascinated by your story about tirupati balaji and uh, the, uh, the his adornments so maybe you can talk if you could talk to us about the most ubiquitous of uh, sense in india which is camphor yeah that was that was a kind of spin off project after i did the book in fact i was um, there were a few aromatics that i wanted to kind of dig deeper with and camphor was a particularly interesting one because you know camphor is it's it's kind of different to say a lot of the woods and the flowers it, you know it's kind of if you sort of you know it's like this sort of weird pure chemical type thing and actually even like the i've got some somewhere i could probably try and grab it in fact in a minute um um sort of the the sort of naturally occurring camphor and still has you know it's like this weird sort of super volatile um smelling stuff crystals and so I was just kind of curious, and I noticed as well that camphor wasn't in really, really ancient texts. So I was like, well, at a certain point, um, camphor must have appeared. And actually, it must have been amazing when it appeared. It must have been like so amazing when camphor appeared, this kind of hyper-volatile crystal that was, you know, probably the first campers were brought from sort of Borneo and Sumatra. So it was just been super expensive at that point. I think we know that at the same period in China when it appeared, it was incredibly expensive. And so it must have been this super precious, amazing new substance. And so I just kind of got curious about, you know, the history of camphor, looked into that. And, you know, I mean, the thing is, one of the things to sort of bear in mind in terms of sort of the methodology of researching these things is, you know, the dating a lot of these texts is difficult. A lot of the texts are built up over centuries and uh, just identifying what words mean is difficult. So it's always, it's always a bit blurry, there's a picture. Um, but the basic picture of camphor was that it seems like the earliest camphor to sort of appear on the scene was this Borneo camphor, sort of Pachacarpura, which you might be familiar with. People, you know, if you, play, if you ever put camping food or pan or something like that, you um, and that appeared first. And, you know, by the mid uh, first millennium, you know, people are mentioning that a lot and people are really into it. And then uh, at the later stage, it seems probably um, distilled types came from like um, China, for example. You hear there's references to this chini, carpora. Um, so that's from a different tree, which you kind of distill. Actually, I've got one in the garden there. It's kind of cool. And um, yeah, so at the later stage, a cheap, probably, a cheap, probably cheaper, um, uh, in, another import of camphor came in. And maybe people were making it in South Asia as well. You can distill it from all sorts of things, in fact. And, um, but I, I was curious about the kind of use of camphor in Hinduism. It's such an iconic thing, like the camphor flame and uh, in Arati and things like that. And so I got curious about how that happened. And, um, well, it, it sort of all came down to the, the use of lamps in worship, in fact. So um, I found early lit that you have these sort of hierarchies of lamp fuels. There's one in the Mahabharata, which would be sort of pretty early. And uh, there, you know, it's kind of like ghee is the best. And then it's kind of, I think it's vegetable oil or something after that. And then it's, um, then like you really don't want to use like animal fat. It's like, don't use animal fat, it's really bad. So there's already an idea that like what you use, and if you think you're in a world of lamps, you know, there's no candles, there's no electricity. You're like everyone's always doing lamp stuff. You know, like the sort of lamp texture must have mattered, the, the materiality of the lamp. So the ghee lamp was the sort of most prestigious one at one point, but then you suddenly kind of like, uh, you know, people obviously started endowing to use a camphor lamp. And if you think camphor, when it appears is super, expensive imported aromatic stuff and you're just burning a chunk of this very you're just like burning like hundred dollar bills just to kind of like it must be a very sort of um prestigious substance and so for example you have um i mean i i, I looked i looked there at um the um the Tidupati temple and you have sort of inscriptions about the use of camphor so you had one from the uh, early 11th century a uh, chola king endowing had endowed like several lamps for the temple and one camphor lamp which is kind of significant that it was like oh i endow i can't remember how many it was like 24 lamps and one camphor lamp a week or something like that so it shows how prestigious the camphor lamp was and, and that that is funny that inscription is kind of followed by another one where a few years later that, that that camphor money is like not going in the right direction so they have to kind of police it 
and uh, so clearly the the camphor flame was this very it was like the fanciest of fancy sort of rarest poshest form of lamp for this you know our Arctica ceremony which is this kind of uh, you know sort of purification and garden yeah you know we all we, we've all seen that um, and um, yeah, so that was kind of interesting. And then um, the other things I got interested in too is while I was, you know, I I went to I actually went to the temple and I sort of spoke to um, the, the one of the one of the priests that does the um, sort of adornments and worship, and asked him um, about about the uh, the narman, this sort of the sort of you know the sort of the you know the, the shape on the head of Balaji, and. Um, and uh, yeah, and it turns out, and I didn't know this. And well, the thing is with that is, in a lot of there's a lot of biology temples around, and people have biology images at home. Sometimes that biology is just part of the statue. You know what I mean? It's just plaster or whatever. And then sometimes in other temples, um, it's just kind of probably like white clay or something like that. Um, but in the actual main biology temple, it is um, a sort of great big sort of brick almost of Borneo camphor that once a week they, um, I don't know if they use a frame, but once a week they basically, they clean the statue and sort of wash it and perfume it. And then um, once a week they build this um, kind of, it must be quite a lot, it must be kind of like quite a lot of stuff. A Borneo camphor, which is interesting, it's kind of quite corrosive, but the statue sort of, you know, survives that. And uh, so they build that up and it's like, it's, if you think about like, how intense camphor is, and you know, this kind of like great big sort of brick of camphor, like it must be like incredibly fragrant thing. And also think how expensive that must have been at one point. And then the line down the middle, in fact, uh, which is shaped like a bamboo leaf, um, that is actually made of musk paste. So it's a very, it's like a great big piece of expensive perfume. And what's striking about that though is how visible it is. And this is a thing that emerged from my research is how these aromatics, they're not just turned into a sort of alcohol. It's like, I'm wearing some fragrance now. You can't tell, or maybe I'm lying. Maybe I'm not, you know what I mean? Okay. But like, if I was wearing one of these um, sort of pre-modern South Asian um, uh, fancy perfumes, you'd see it. You'd see I have like stripes on my face or my arms or something like that. Thank you. And um, yeah, so I looked at that. Actually, they do hand it out sometimes if, if you're looking at it as a facade. And then it's like a very intense experience of this stuff, which has um, um, this camphor, which has touched the um, sacred image. I don't, and, uh, sorry. I don't think many people know that, that this uh, namam, as we call it, is made of camphor with musk in the middle. I think. Yeah, that's the real one. But what, what's interesting with camphor is um, I, you know, well, actually, this kind of all came up because the whole camper thing came up because I was looking into, um, I think I'd seen in the newspaper something about how like some Hindu temples in America banned camper because, you know, you, you've probably seen they get very black, these temples that if you sort of home camper, the sort of cheap, regular ritual camper makes a lot of almost like it's almost like burnt plastic. It's like this sort of weird, sticky, hairy smoke. And um, so I was like curious about that. And uh, well, it turns out there's this really cool story about that, which is how camphor got cheap, which is basically in the late 19th century, they were sort of experimenting to make um, plastics, sort of as sort of ivory and tortoiseshell substitutes, basically, is the game. And uh, they, um, yeah, uh, they um, discovered celluloid, basically. Well, they discovered early plastics, but they were really, really in unstable and brittle and sort of explosives and things. So they discovered, um, if you want to add camphor to these early plastics, it stabilized it. And so this, uh, this led to this enormous, if you see the statistics for world camphor usage from like about like 1860 to like 1900, it goes in, it just, the, it, the graph is incredible. Uh, and this was mainly plastics and celluloid. And, and celluloid became really big when it got used for film. So there was this huge sort of trade war over camphor because all the camphor at that point was natural. And um, it, the main producer was Japan from their colony in Taiwan. And they had this kind of grip on the camphor market. So even when somebody synthesized it, there was a camphor factory in London, I think. The Japanese did all this sort of clever trade manipulation where they'd flood the market with camphor and several years and put this 
synthetic camphor factory out of business. And there were all these attempts to grow camphor in Florida and, and in India, in fact, to sort of get this sort of independent supply of camphor. And so there was this sort of like struggle over getting hold of camphor, which we've all forgotten, um, for plastic though. Uh, and for, for photography, in fact. And then eventually, you know, they got a really good synthesis, DuPont got a really good synthesis going and it was sort of efficient and cheap. And then they sort of spread around the world and you have big camphor factories. But then, then, then of course, when you have that, camphor gets super, super, super cheap. I mean, distilled camphor was already more ubiquitous than like ancient camphor. But still at that point, camphor just becomes like, so, so it's almost like, it's incredibly cheap. Uh, and, and that basically led to this almost disturbance in the ecology of Hindu worship, where there's these insane copious amounts of camphor being used. Yes. Um, and then you've got too much camphor and you have to ban it because there's too much smoke in the temple and stuff. So it was kind of one of the things that led to that kind of um, imbalance in camphor usage was um, plastic. In fact. Like many things bad in the world, plastic was the cause. <laughs> it's true, yeah, plastic, yeah. So, James, I have a video to show you. I visited a temple in Madurai, which was to the god Vishnu. It's uh, down the road from the Binakshi temple that you allude to in, my, in your talks and books. And the priest there was busy all day. He would only see me before the evening worship. He just had a bath and he, he's wearing this uh, towel on his head and he's getting ready. And I'm in this room. And it is so fragrant with this kasturi and turmeric and and the reason I want to show you this sort of very shaky video is they still follow the same namam except not with camphor but with other ingredients. So I'm going to request Raghu to play the video. But all saints and Brahma, the Deva, Devas, Devas Brahma, Shiva, Indra, and 33 crores of Devas requested Lord Bhagavad to, to protect Dharma from Hiranyasara, hmm. from the dangerous event of Hiranyasara. So, um, so there, there you have it happening today in temples, I guess, like Beyonce becomes the cosmetic icon, <laughs> Venkateshwara and his Namam have been followed by priests all over South India. No, absolutely. And, and that really emphasizes, it's a great clip, it emphasizes the visual. I mean, I don't know what, exactly what he's using. I mean, it might, I mean, there's many different sort of, you know, mixes and substances people use for that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, it really emphasizes the visuality. And you'll see these on miniature paintings where like sort of Krishna will have sort of um, sandalwood stripes on his arms and you, uh, not just that, yeah, I mean, I remember reading the Mahabharata at one point, uh, somebody had a, cl a big club that was covered in, you know, sandalwood and agar wood. Yes. And um, this is sort of visible, the visibleness of the, 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 the half cosmetic, half perfume, and there'd be tactile as well, would be cool, obviously sandalwood would be cool. So, yeah. Which is my cue to ask you to talk about the others um, in your book, um, James, the other main aromatics. You mentioned agar wood, sandalwood, musk, saffron to start. But you also talk about the layering and how visual it is, how scent is visual. Yeah, so there's that, there's that aspect that I think we've sort of seen quite well is how these, these materials were not uh, sort of turned into a sort of distilled, refined alcohol solution. It was just invisibly applied. They would be, well, you know, if you think of the, the, the principal sort of really prestigious ones would be sort of sandalwood, agar wood, saffron, camphor, and musk. There's loads of others as well. There's like so many in fact, and they all have lots of different names, which makes reading about them really confusing. Um, but they're the sort of main ones. But if you think of them, they're all like, you know, sort of bulky things like sandalwood or, or, or saffron, and they're quite brightly colored. And so, um, but the way they'd be processed would be they'd be like ground, say the sandalwood would be kind of ground into a 
paste with water on a stone, and then people might add saffron, add camphor, add musk, uh, or you, you might have red sandalwood. Um, and so then you'd have this very sort of colored paste, but the same would apply to sort of the oils, obviously garlands are very visual. And so the, the whole sort of, the experience of wearing this would be, you know, you'd see if somebody had them on from a distance, like you do with two of Um, You would also, the person wearing them would feel them, but also it wasn't so much that the jasmine and the sandalwood and etc. were all distilled into the same bottle. They were all, they had to be kind of layered, like you say, and um, matched. And there's this really good story in a tech called the Brahat Kataha Shloka Sangraha by Buddha Swamin, and, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, it's a good read. And uh, there's a story in that though. Sorry? Say it slowly, please. Brahat, Brahat Kata Shloka Samgraha. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, my Sanskrit pronunciation is not, my, my English pronunciation is horrible than <laughs> my, my Sanskrit pronunciation. But um, there's a story in that where there's a, um, uh, a guy who's really um, obsessed with perfumes and there's another guy who's trying to kind of impress him to get in with him for complicated reasons. And shloka, shloka is under her. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, so he's, um, yeah, so uh, to, to impress this guy who's obsessed with perfumes, um, what he, well, the, the guy who's obsessed with perfumes, they meet and the guy has kind of got garlands and stuff on and he burns some incense and the new guy who's trying to impress him walks in and he grabs his head and he goes, oh my God, I've got a migraine, this is just terrible, I can't stand it in here. And the, 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 the prince, the perfume obsessed one goes, what's wrong? And he goes, oh man, you, you mixed the wrong incense for those garlands and everything else. And they, they just don't go together. And the Prince goes, oh, really? Hmm. And he's testing him, you see. And then he sort of says, you know, well, mix another one. So he gets his little sort of box out and mixes stuff and burns it. And that matches. It's like wearing all like the worst. It's like the worst. It's like bad food and wine or, or terrible clothes combinations or something. And, uh, and then the guy, having seen the new guy's ability to get the right perfume matching um, goes, ah, you're, you're an expert in perfume. You are a real expert in perfumes. You're not just trying to insinuate your way into my life to, which he is in fact. Um, so yeah, but this, that, that kind of gives us a sense that there was an idea that you had to match this stuff and it had to be matched to the seasons and all sorts of things as well. So um, it was yeah. a very different way of wearing scent to just going, Shh, and it's just all oh. done. Um, your, reading your book made me wonder, see, in ancient India people wore very, uh, it was like the ancient Greeks, the clothes were just robes and therefore uh, scents were visible. So you wore the garland, you wore it around your neck and wore it on your hand and then the, like you said the paste. Uh, so do you think it is because India is tropical that led to this linking of smell and visual stuff? Because you could actually see it, unlike say Iceland or where you can't see. Even if you do sandalwood paste on your arms, you couldn't see it. So, do you think that uh, I don't know about Arabia because I don't know what they wore in the past, but because India is a tropical land, it allowed for sense to be visual. Do you think that uh, is a theory that makes sense to you? Yeah, I think that could be that could be the case in the sense that like you know you know it's not like everyone's just sort of like completely wrapped up all the time that you, you know, there would be it's in private at least there'd be more and it's in private that you sort of show you adornments people would have more of their sort of body visible no I think that's a good point in fact and um, and also it's just partly a funk well I feel like there's almost a sort of weird almost like sort of dialectic between something like saffron it, it does have this beautiful scent um but it's also a really good color so it's kind of and it's precious which is desirable as well sort of rare and precious so there's almost a kind of like back and forth between like well saffron's colored so it makes a really good thing because you can see it but it also smells good so like I, it's not i mean as as well as the sort of the showing of skin there's this kind of complicated thing in that i think some of the scents that became more valued part of their appeal was the fact that they were visual. So there you end up with the, um, the sort of smell 
palette that was most valued and most typical, that that particular choice is somewhat connected to the fact that those things were visible. And, and this is all in this context of, um, like you say, um, more skin visible, but also the fact that um, if you put a, especially if you put a, a paste on, I mean, oils and things are different, but especially the paste, they would be cooling, uh, which seems to kind of go way back, especially with sandal, the sort of cooling. Speaking of, you call sandalwood the alpha scent. <laughs> and why, can you talk a little bit about the the main ones, the sandalwood? We have visuals as you talk. As oh, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. So sandalwood really comes up as the sort of, in term, especially you'll often have um, examples of like, there are two types of scent, good smell, bad smell. And they'll often give an example, say a commentator. And sometimes the good one's jasmine, but often that will be sandalwood. Um, Sandalwood, the, the thing is with, sandalwood is a good example though, is um, there's loads and loads of types of sandalwood. It's a bit like, it's not just sandalwood, um, and it's not just like Santalum album. Um, there's dozens of types of sandalwood, um, there's different, even within that, the sub varieties sort of named after places of origin and so on. So, I mean, that's a lesson to learn is not to get too hung up on matching the Sanskrit words to one modern botanical name, because definitely when you say read in a poem about sandalwood, um, if you kind of go to a more specialized uh, medical lexicon, there's a, there's a lot of options for what sandalwood was. And uh, some of them, some of them were said to come from sort of within India, and then some were said to be imported as, as well. And the, but the main property common to all of them is that they're cooling. And some are more fragrant, some are less. Seems to have been precious because I mean, sandalwood and agar wood um, and some of the substances, I'm less clear about what they are, were are part of the contents of the treasury in the Artashastra. So, uh, and if you think as well with sandalwood and agarwood, they keep. It's not, I mean, obviously jasmine doesn't keep, uh, musk doesn't keep super long in fact. But sandalwood and agar wood keeps for ages. There's a, there's, a, there's a Buddhist temple in Japan has this big log of agar wood, which um, they've had for centuries, you know what I mean? And it's belonged to like various historical emperors and it's, I'm sure it's still really amazing smelling. Yeah, so agar was an interesting one, which is kind of like less commonly known uh, these days in South Asia. It's very big in the Middle East. Uh, the best image there is the one on the bottom left. That's, that's the best and the most representative one. You've got the oil on the right, which is a really um, popular perfume, especially in the Middle East. Um, the, the Bukur of Middle East has agar wood, is the, the yes. one? Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, the way they make that is they use, the thing is with agar wood is, you know, you've got the tree and uh, you have this tree grows in Assam and parts of Southeast Asia. So that was always an import, basically, to the part from in Assam. And uh, when the tree gets infected by a certain fun well, a certain uh, number of species of tree, yet again, it's not just one thing. And um, when it gets infected by a certain fungus, you know, where the fungus is present, uh, the tree secretes kind of resin, uh, this sort of dark brown resiny sort of oily stuff. And then, you know, when you cut the tree down, if you're lucky, there'll be like patches of this in it and you sort of whittle the white wood and you're left with these sort of strange, deformed, spiky shapes. Um, which are kind of highly valued, especially in China, in fact. And that's the agar wood. And yet again, even now, if you're in Dubai, there's loads and loads and loads of types and grades. It's, it's incredible um, how many types there are. And it can be very expensive still. And that was, well, where sandalwood is all cool and uh, white, yellow, red, uh, and it's all about grinding with water to make a paste. I mean, they use it in incenses and loads of things, but in a way, its primary thing is this sort of cooling thing. Um, agar wood was primarily uh, burned and is heating and is black as well. So um, oh, I'm going to turn the light out, a bit better light I think. And um, yeah, so agar, agar wood, but interesting, agar wood is kind of like less used in India these days. If you look at these early perfume recipes, there's um, uh, you get a you get a ton of them, and actually the word agar bati, the agar there is agar wood, but actually most agar bati don't contain it anymore. It's just incredibly expensive, and actually some of the trees are quite endangered. So, so in a way, that's disappeared the, somewhat from the palette. Go on. So, so the sambrani or the the thing that women put in the hair is not agar wood. No, so I think sambrani, in my experience, tends to refer to benzoin resin. 
And that is one of the um, unexplored avenues of this research, in fact, which is like, you know, because benzoin comes from, I assume most Sambrani is uh, benzoin. I mean, I've, I've not really looked into it. It's just from what I've smelled myself, in fact. And, uh, and benzoin is from Southeast Asia, and it's a kind of, uh, basically, it seems to have, in China at least, it seems to have kind of become popular as a kind of frankincense substitute. So yep. maybe that kind of came into South India in the same way that it was a kind of, you know, easier to get Sambrani at some point than frankincense. Um, but it's hard to know for sure. Yeah, but the, the history of Sambrani, and uh, I've never gone there, but it's an interesting one. They that, they burned Sambrani in the um, Balaji but, temple in the, the sanctuary. But, uh, yeah. A French perfumer told me that smoke was the way to reach the gods. So in every religion, whether it's Christianity, Islam, or Hinduism, they had some version of holy smoke, fragrant smoke, which was lit to, because the smoke goes to the heavens and reaches the gods. And Agarbati is very common in India. And in your book, you talk about spending time in Mysore with an Agarbati brand and how uh, I, it was years ago, I'm sure, but I wonder if you can recall about how it is adapted to modern times because I don't think they use agar wood anymore in agarbati. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they don't. I mean, maybe some brands do a little bit, but typically not. I mean, the other, a lot of the other ingredients are probably like similar, like the sandalwood, and there's all these kind of roots, things like uh, jatamansi. I think we've got an image of that. Uh, this sort of these sort of Himalayan roots, like um, costas root. Uh, Jetamansi, they tend to have these sort of slightly sort of musty, sort of, they're great there, I love them, uh, aromas. They're, they're ancient um, um, substances, things like Googaloo as well. Googaloo goes way back, you've got Googaloo Innovators, that seems to be like uh, one of the um, earliest ones used. So in, in many ways they're, they're, they're pretty similar, but the uh, the musk is not used anymore, uh, I think it's banned in India, in fact. and uh, the um, the uh, agar was largely gone, um, but it, it, you know there was always a lot of flexibility with these things anyway. And uh, yes, here, here we have that's the jetamansi, that's the sort of Himalayan thing, and you can see the root there is what you use with these sort of funny furry, tufty round roots on the left, these spikes, spike nard. And um, did they discover all this empirically, James? For example, I'm looking at that. Thing and I'm, I'm thinking, how did the ancient world people know the root is the one that's going to smell good? It's is it just empirical exper experimentation, just over? Yeah. Well, actually, we don't. We never. We never know. If you know what I mean. I mean, what happens really is like we, if you're studying it, is suddenly something appears. It starts being mentioned, and then there's this issue of was it there before, but we just don't understand the word. Um, or was it there, but they just weren't talking about it? Or, um, you know, or does that word for that thing even really mean that? Or did it come to mean it later? Like, if you think of the word like corn in America means maize, corn in England many centuries ago just meant sort of a grain, you know, sort of cereal grain. So there's these issues of like, do the, what do the words even mean for these things? So that's how we know these things appear. They just sort of probably appear in the written record. Maybe as well, you, you know, archaeologists have things like uh, bits of charred wood and, uh, you know, pollen. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of hard to know. Uh, and I think it must have been a gradual process, though, that, you know, maybe you would have a given community in a given area sort of had over the centuries, millennia, learned about the herbs available to them and maybe through contact um, sort of, as a, you know, traded it with other people who developed a taste for it, a demand grew for it. I mean, you can probably see that going on with camphor. When you think with camphor, there must have been a moment where camphor wasn't there and then it was there, but it's just like day one of camphor like, what, how did anyone know what to do with it? I mean, everyone must have gone, wow, that's kind of crazy stuff. It's so intense and strange crystals. It looks like salt, but it's like really, but like, if you think, and it is very rare, expensive stuff, the day it appears, how did anyone know what to do with it? Or, or why would anyone spend money on this completely new thing? But you do see this kind of appearance of new things throughout the centuries, like the musk appears at a certain point. And yet again, it's like, oh, this is weird stuff in China. How do we... What do we do with it or from Tibet or Nepal? You know, how do we even know what to do with it? So, um, 
So when you say yeah. Borneo camphor, is it from Borneo, the island? Um, well, Borneo camphor is an actual sort of type of camphor. It's actually a chemical thing, um, but it is connected to. Um, it is the it is the one that would occur. It's like this big tree that grows in Borneo and Sumatra, and um, if there's a kind of crevice in the tree, um, it's almost like sort of stalagmites or something. There's these crystals form over time in the tree. And if you, you know, if you cut the tree down, there'll be these sort of pockets of camphor, but you can very, you can also distill that tree right. and you can make it synthetically as well. Um, but somewhere, and I couldn't find it now, but somewhere I do have a little file that somebody sent me of real taken from the tree Borneo camphor. So it's what you'd have got, you know, coming off a ship, <laughs> like, you know, 1700 years ago. And it is, it's a bit pinky, but it's mostly just like this incredibly volatile, it looks like salt. Yeah. And it's incredibly, um, no, and I think even to this day, uh, at least in South India, households buy this thing called pachak karpura, which is raw karpura, yeah. and they eat it, and they mix it with stuff, and they eat it, and they put it in kesari or uh, kesari bath for this fragrance. And a contemporary artist in, in, in South India, whose name escapes me, actually did a sculpture on camphor, and, and then the sculpture just disappears, which was part of its charm. Um, um, yeah, the Patikar Porter is the Borneo camphor. It's the kind of good one. That's the one they use um, in the Vinanam, isn't that? Yes. yes. Um, Anita Rao has asked a question, which I was going to ask you later, which is, what are books that people like us can go um, to if we want to learn more about ancient sense? And uh, you've, you have a lovely appendix, but what are some of the standout books that you would recommend to our audience if they want to go deeper um, into perfumery. Yeah, so, well, in terms of secondary books, you know, I've got my book, I guess, and yep. then there's also the work of, um, and this is, I think you can get scans of this online, um, this amazing scholar, P.K. Godet, who was the curator in the 20th century, he died in 1961, I think, of the Bandarka Oriental Institute, and he, they have, so, they have such an insane collection of manuscripts there, and he really just, he just, like, clearly spent his day sort of rummaging through them and just looking at all sorts of things and wrote these two amazing volumes called Studies in Indian Cultural History by P.K. Godet. You can often, I think there are scans online and they're, they're just, full, he, well, he was the person really that kind of got the study of Indian um, perfumery and cosmetics going and he sort of described various texts and doesn't always give translations so you sort of need to know Sanskrit but they're really good studies and they're sort of foundational as well. There's also a book by Moti Chandra, um, I think, or half a book that's on cosmetics and perfumery. That's more based on art history. So it's sort of about people applying it in mirrors and things like that. Um, but they're good. But in terms of the actual sort of sources, um, I actually always think a good place is the, the earliest major text that we have about this that has a big chapter on it is the, the one in the Brihat Samita of Rahamihira which is sixth century. And um, that's just great. Um, that's a really early, I think it's the earliest sort of full on, like here's a load of stuff with recipes and stuff like that. You can get translations for that. There's good clear commentaries available from that as well. And uh, yeah, look, that's a good one with the recipes. And that's interesting though, it starts with hair dyes. And there's a lot of, actually I did a bit of research in hair dyes and I'm very into hair dyes. There's, you know, there's no point in doing anything else if you haven't like sorted your gray hairs out. And there's a whole thing about gray hairs and like, oh, I saw a gray hair and everything's over. Yeah. And uh, we've all been there. And um, so there's this whole hair dye thing, but it starts out with hair dyes as the foundation and then moves through different formats. Yes. And the final one is uh, pan, beetle. Uh, and I've actually sort of noticed with this sort of alcohol project where I've been looking at pan history a bit, but um, the, not all, but some of the earliest references to palm when it appears classified along with perfume, because a mouth perfume. It's all, yeah, again, how did that get going? When, when that started, how did people decide to start doing that? So the Bahat Summit is a good one, good yes. recipe there. There's some there that as well that are sort of mathematically interesting where you have a kind of grid with, yes. it's, almost like a, it's like a magic square with like different kind of amounts. Yes. And, um, you know, you can kind of, each thing adds up to kind of, I don't know, 60 ounces and you can just do all, you know, dozens of combinations of ingredients. And then the other one I'd say is the, the Gandhasara, Gandhawada, 
which was edited by Vyas. And uh, I don't know if there's a scan of that online. You get it at a good library. And uh, that's not, that's PK Godi studied that. And I talk about that in my book a lot, but that's, it's hard going, but it's, that's the most comprehensive one. But it's hard, it is hard going. And the hard thing is really to work out what a lot of the words mean, if you're being really precise about it. One of the things that uh, it talks about the Gandha Sara is uh, Surya Paka Vidhi, which people still do in South India. And it talks about if you want good hair oil for the gray hair you mentioned, you dip a garland of scented flowers in the oil, keep it in the sun and overnight, I mean, let the sun's rays warm it. And then next day, put another scented uh, garland with the oil and then apply it to your hair. And then they all have, it has all the formulas. We use manjishta and use, even now in South India, at least in Kerala, people use hibiscus uh, flowers and leaves for their hair. Um, so that still goes on. And um, so that's the material culture of, and then they use curry leaves. Here in Karnataka, they steep curry leaves in coconut oil and also garlic if you want your hair to grow. So that perfumery stuff is still happening. Um, so James, my next question to you will have to do uh, with medical fumigation, but we can get to that. I'm going to invite SS to speak. He has asked a few questions and uh, I'm going to invite him to Hi, uh, my name is Shrunga. Um, uh, lovely talk and there's so much that we got out of both Shoba and James. Um, James, I, I would want to um, ask you about this particular internal, external um, olfaction that you speak about in your book. So do you think um, there are certain practices that, you know, um, and they also, you know, there is a lot to um, do with the kind of food people eat and uh, there is um, the kind of food that influences your body odor as well. So wanted to know if there is um, this connect that you're speaking about in particular. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I mentioned that right at the beginning, this idea there's a classification, there's lots of classifications, but there's a classification in terms of internal and external. And obviously external will be things like garlands, and then there's some things that are actually sort of like rubbed into your skin, and then internal will be, you know, sort of things like mouth perfumes. And I mean, the thing is, that's, that's a, in a way, what that highlights to me is Yet again, it's not just a little spritz on your wrist, that it's like your hair would be centered, your clothes would have powders on, you'd have a garland, and uh, but also you'd perfume your mouth, you'd be chewing a sort of yeah. uh, citron peel. And seeds and pan. Yeah, and all sorts of loads of actual mixtures for sort of mouth things. Um, and uh, and then you'd also you'd have had a complex bath that removed bad odors and sort of used right. perfume waters which would have been sort of washed off. So it's just a concern that the entire body, um, as much as perfumable, in terms of diet and things, I can't, I'm trying to think of anything much about people, anything in my text about people who live on X. I mean, there's that whole thing about Matsya Gandhi because she's a fisherman's daughter. She smells of fish, mm -hmm. but she also smells of fish because she was born out of a fish. So, you know, that's the sort of different thing. But then mm -hmm. I've, in the alcohol research, I've come across these um, recipe, well, I've come across references to where there's, a, there's one in the Brahat Katha, Shon Kassandra. There's a guy, there's a guy pretending to be a Brahmin and uh, for, everyone's always pretending to be somebody else in that text. But there's a guy pretending yeah. to be a Brahmin, but they catch him out because his breath smells of booze. Mm. And then I've also found some other, um, texts that give recipes um, on formulae that hide the smell of alcohol because it gives that away. So obviously some people were trying to hide that smell. Yeah. So I texted James and said uh, there's a bunch of questions so to pace his answers and keep uh, keep them as short as possible. Uh, Arun is ready to ask you a question. Arun Shankar. Hi Arun, your question is next. Do you would you like to come online? Hello. Yeah, we can Hello. hear you, Arun. We can hear you. So my question is, uh, like, does this perfumes in the ancient Indian uh, past has gender constriction to the usage? Ah, that's a great question. It's um, it's funny. I remember when I went for the interview for my current job, somebody asked that, and it's like, ah, you've ignored gender. <laughs> but in a way, it was. 
it's like, well, I haven't because they, they're not particularly interested in that. There's, I mean, there probably are sort of subtle nuances, but in general, um, it's not as gender. There isn't, in two, in, on two levels, there isn't this whole thing of like, oh, sort of like women wear more stuff and men are not fragranced. It seems like it was both, you know, both genders were using it pretty much similar. I mean, there would be slight differences, but basically everyone was pretty perfumed. Who could afford it? Obviously, it's a class difference, class difference. Uh, obviously, if you're a farmer, you might not be wearing tons of garlands. But um, also, um, there, there, isn't, there isn't that thing you kind of get, say, or maybe you used to get where, you know, like, you know, certain odors, like, you know, floral odors would be feminine and others like sort of musk and citrus would be masculine. You don't have that either. So basically, actually, no. And in a way, that's one thing that the, I got from this project is, it was a kind of uh, foil for becoming aware of how gendered on many levels our um, uh, use of fragrance. And I mean, I used to sometimes hand around like flowers in class and like, this is a few years ago, but it wouldn't be unusual that these sort of like sporty jockey guys would, they wouldn't even smell it. They're just handed along in this kind of, I'm so manly. I would never be seen smelling a flower. So you don't have anything like that um, in South Asia. Yeah. Uh, Ashrit, would you like to uh, come and uh, um, uh, come online or uh, to ask your question? And Ankit Ravani also talks about uh, the books that explain certain scents. So um, I think you've given a couple, Brihat, Sam, Brihat, uh, Brihat Samhita and Gandhasara would be good places to start and also PK Gode, right? PK Gode, yeah, those PK Godes. And also, if you're interested in these kinds of questions, just get those studies in Indian cultural history volumes. There's, there's stuff on there and everything. There's stuff on like the early texts on tobacco in India and what people said about that when it appeared. Uh, okay. A lot of Marathi stuff in there, if anyone knows Marathi. There's loads of Marathi stuff. So. Ashrit has a question, and I, I'm going to invite him online. Hi, Ashrit. We can hear you. Yeah. Please unmute and speak. Can you hear me? Yeah, here we can now. Perfect. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It's been very insightful. So my question is this. Uh, if India has such a rich heritage of uh, perfumery as such, why is it that the perfume scene in the modern age is completely dominated by the French uh, commercial companies and um, you know the mostly the European ones you see of uh, you talk of Chanel and all that? Have we not been able to garner the potential to you know take take out the Indian perfumery to the global scene? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if I can really totally answer it because you know you have to sort of know the global picture. I mean, one thing to bear in mind is that within India often the most prestigious perfumes were seen as sort of somewhat exotic and imported. You tend to think sandalwood is from India, but you know, camphor, agar wood, and even sometimes sandalwood was seen as a kind of prestigious imported thing. And so if you actually look at, you know, when I've ever asked people sort of like say, very wealthy people in sort of 19th century, early 20th century India, they'd often be uh, they'd often, maybe not in ritual settings, but in kind of luxury, sort of secular settings, they'd be using um, uh, imported things like French perfume. Um, but that's in a way, con that's not some sort of westernization, that's a sort of continuation of this taste for the exotic, um, which would be exotic then. But in terms of why um, it hasn't dominated, I think it is starting to kind of like come in a bit. I think it's tastes. Um, it, they, Sort of like, say, if you take a, a, an attar, an itter, like uh, one of these was like Hina, it's it's such a, it's like it's sort of like Indian music. It's such just a radically different sort of feel to what you're sort of schooled in with the French ones, which are, uh, and the, the the format is alcohol based, and you know they're very light and floral. I mean, if you think a lot of European ones, they descend from sort of things like eau de cologne which is this sort of citrusy, it's like gin or something. <laughs> I mean, it's like not that far off gin. Whereas, you know, they're, they're really, it's a very different family with the Indian ones. Uh, so it's kind of, maybe it's like a hard sell. Um, um, but I think, I, think, I think the sort of traditional Indian perfumes are coming back and they're big, they're big in the Middle East. So it's, it's more like Europe, I think, that's sort of um, 
Yeah. But that's a great question. I mean, like that will be something to look into, exactly the, the deep, the full history of that. Shubham has two questions. I would like to uh, invite him to ask his questions. Hello. Yeah, we can. Yeah, thank you for this wonderful talk. It has been very insightful. So the two questions I have is the first one is, can you tell us more about Ashtagandha, which is very predominant here in Maharashtra. And the other is like, if we refer to devotion of Vishnu, there is a lot of involvement of sin. But if you refer to Shaivism, we don't see a lot of involvement of sin. So is there any reference to that as well? Yeah, they're great questions. Um, I feel like I can't really a answer the Ashtaganda one. I've sort of I've had Ashtaganda, I've sort of seen lists of ingredients. I can't say I ever really chased down like when that formula first appeared, if it first appeared in, you know, if it first only appeared in religious settings and, and, and what it came down to. That would be, I, I really can't answer that to be honest, but it's a great question. There are various combinations like that, various sort of regional things as well. Um, I wonder, the thing is, it'd be interesting to look at if you actually looked in some a Purana that had an Ashtaganda recipe and if everything in there is still in there, because yet again, it might have things like, you know, that you can't use these days. Uh, so I apologize, I can't really answer that. And the second one, what was the second question again? Um, and if I can chime in just a little bit, um, um, uh, Shubham. Um, in South India, we have a saying that uh, uh, Vishnu is an Alankara Priya and sh uh, Shiva is an Abhisheka Priya. And you said, why is Vishnu associated with the sense? And again, this is a tale that's told, comes down the generations and that Vishnu is a lover of Alankara and Shiva is a lover of Abhisheka and the ascetic. So I do, uh, James can feel free to add to that, but that's what the lived experience is. No, I think that's even, yeah, I think that's basically, oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. the question was, why is Vishnu associated with sense and not Shiva? Yeah, I think it's mainly that, that like a lot of the sort of, uh, you know, forms of Vishnu worship or just sort of Vishnu is, is sort of has a sort of regal persona and a regal aesthetics. So it, that sort of fits with, you know, with things like, um, you know, perfumes and ornament. Whereas the more aesthetic, like you say, the more aesthetic, uh, uh, personality of, of, forms of a lot of forms of Shiva is associated with like you know things like white ash you know like things like sort of simple adornments yes. so I mean, it, you know broad outlines I think that's the basic answer to that but I'm sure there's all sorts of complicated exceptions in very yeah. specific temples you know yeah. uh, the Ketaki flower is not used for Vishnu because of the story but so there are exceptions to perfumery in that Anushka your question next please uh, hello, Ms. Narayan and Mr. McHugh. Uh, my mm -hmm. question to you is, when we like scent, however, something like the smell of fish is very pungent and disliked by the masses. Why do we have a universal liking for certain scents and dislike certain others? Is this a sense we've developed over the years or is it intrinsic within us? Uh, yeah. That's yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, that, yeah, that's a, a big question. Is there, is there sort of like, uh, is there sort of universal dislike in sort of, you know, the human animal of a certain sense or not? Um, I mean, and what is the, you know, to what extent is there sort of a cultural construction of sense? Um, I mean, that's not, I'm not the person to answer that definitively, if you know what I mean, for something like fish or sort of excrement or something like that. But, uh, but it's interesting though, like, um, there are, I mean, like, if I, it, say something like, you know, civet, you know, is a perfume, but like it's kind of gross smelling or a bit weird smelling at least. And then if you think, you know, like you might have some French cheeses that people in France smell nice, think smell nice, and people elsewhere, I mean, I like them, but like people might think they're horrible. But even something like Costas root, I mean, I think Costas root is beautiful, but I've, I've definitely shown that to students and they've been like, ooh, it smells like kind of like really musty and horrible and sweaty. I don't like that at all. So there, there's clearly an element of cultural construction somewhat. Actually, the classic one is the wintergreen in America, the sort of, uh, it's this stuff, I, mean, I think in India and in England, I think it just smells like weird pink ointment that your grandmother might use. But Americans put it in toothpaste, they put it in chewing gum, and it's just like, oh, why would you use that? So there is some cultural construction of um, responses to odor. 
But as to if there's sort of universal discussed causes too, and that would be more of a thing for sort of psychologists and. Anushka, I'm going to say, uh, give my theory and James can correct me. I think your question alludes to the fact that just like babies like a certain taste, a basic sweet taste, is there a basic smell that is universally liked? And I would like to venture that jasmine or fl floral sweetness might be liked everywhere. Whereas the other smells that James talks about is cultural. And we may think it's, we may think jatamansi and costus root is great, but a Chinese person may not. Would, so would it be fair to say floral sweet smelling uh, uh, sweet smells are are like the baby level even babies like them James or not really I'm not really sure I mean the thing is like something like the smell of honey I mean I wonder if anyone anywhere in the world sort of hates the smell of honey I don't know um, it's, it's it's kind of it's really hard to know for sure but I mean I I, I think it's sort of reasonable to think there are some sort of universal good smell, like milk, universal. milky good like sort of fresh milky smells and things like yeah that. i was gonna say mother's milk but yeah. is that there with um, yeah. yeah yeah rohini uh please ask your question and you have to unmute yeah uh can you hear me yeah 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 yeah, uh, so uh, it's a very uh, lovely talk I'm uh, hearing for the first time. I'm an archaeologist, but I never thought that anybody could be working on the sense. It's a lovely talk. And uh, I just want to ask whether uh, you have come across any sculptures depicting the uh, uh, any activity related to the scent. And then if yes, then what is the date of those sculptures and where I can go and uh, look at them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there's one on the one of the one of the sort of posters or fly when we started this talk, there was one which I think is somebody grinding sandalwood. It's from Patadakal. I think oh, I can't I'd have to check. I think it's from the Vidu Paksha temple at Patadakal, um, which I think is like about ninth century. Um, and there there's a kind of one image on a pillar of um, uh, a, a woman on a couch, um, almost like sort of declining Vishnu, but it's a woman, and she's being fanned and massaged, and at her feet there's a woman, you know, it looks like a rolling pin or something, but um, I think that's probably somebody grounding sandalwood. Because actually in literary texts, um, you get these descriptions of going through the courtyards of a fancy house, and in one courtyard, there's, and there's a few versions of this description that I think they're probably like based on each other, but one courtyard was people grinding perfumes and crushing perfumes. So, you know, there was a sort of daily production of perfumes. Um, uh, so I guess in terms of archaeological evidence, you'd be looking for sort of these sort of grinding stones, uh, like, uh, which could be used for other things, I guess. But um, that's the one I know of. But I think uh, there's people with, there's people, um, I think, uh, I think there's a Buddhist monk in Ajantar with an incense burner as well and there's some quite old um, sort of hand you know with a handle incense burners but um i didn't for this there's lots of people with mirrors and things like that but i when i was doing this i didn't really get into the art historical material so much and so i've only just picked up a few examples since um but i, I think that's there's one at article i assume actually if you look at sculptures of people being sort of pampered more with people in the background you might get more of this uh you know sandalwood Rubbing image. Great there question there. That's something to look out for, in fact. Nini, you probably know this, but the other temple that comes to mind is Rani Kibav, uh, uh, where uh, the Apsaras are uh, in yes. various yes. positions. Yes. Yes. yes, it is there. I have seen that, but I was uh, wondering whether South Indian temple somewhere he has seen it. Paksha, as James. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's one. Yeah. Uh, people. There's lots of ones of women painting the faces. That's yeah. a different. I've not seen that many of people. Um, the sort of servants preparing for the basic sort of the, the manufacture as it were. So James, there are 12 more questions and we have 15 minutes. So a minute a question. Yes. Hi. So I wanted to ask, um, I, I'm, I, uh, I'm into gardening and I collect a lot of old roses. So out of curiosity, I wondered, uh, since we have a lot of native species of roses to the Himalayas, and also irises and uh, or what we uh, know as oris. Um, when is it that mentions of such materials or fragrances actually arrive or such flowers or plants arrive in Indian scriptures and literature, whether essentially uh, indigenous or 
uh, Persianized, but when when does it really start off? Are there any mentions in ancient scriptures? I well, yet again, you you run into that question of like you know was something like the rose there, but they weren't talking about it, and we just don't understand the word right. Um, I I'm not sure. Um, actually, the person to answer that would be uh, Nicholas Ropp that um, gave a talk on gardening a few weeks ago. Who knows all? He knows that period really well. He knows especially about roses. In fact, he knows a lot about. But um, I'd, I'd sort of say a you know, sort of early modern period, maybe I don't know, maybe 14, 15, 16th century, something like that, with roses. Um, I, I've no, I never thought about Oris and Iris before. In fact. That could be there, but like just sort of we don't realize what the, the word means. But the rose, I think, I think relatively recently. Um, but you know, like I said, it's hard to know. And there could have been people in certain regions using it, you know. Um, yeah, so but good question. I'm not, you know, not totally sure. I don't, I don't think it's in the ancient scriptures. I don't think. I only ask it. as we have many native species here, such as Muscata and Renonia, which are essentially the source of musk. And probably the the parental ancestors of the Damas. So, yeah, I suspect that the people living there were, might well have been using them. And I mean, it's that thing. Sometimes, like people will call their local product by the sort of more universal name for that class of thing. But uh, that's a good question. In fact, so you could look at the vernacular names for those flowers. In fact, in in the local languages, and that might kind of that might be revealing. In fact, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Harangat. Lauren, next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for organizing uh, this conversation between the two of you. And I um, would like to ask a question also about um, written sources in the English language on um, the social perception of, uh, of women in India. And this is uh, because, yeah, I started this um, artist project last year uh, during a residency in Bangalore. And I noticed that, um, yeah, I wasn't able to find um, any any written sources. Well, which is how I stumbled upon uh, your book, James. Oh, right. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Uh, <laughs> women in general. Uh, I mean, the Karma Sutra is a good place to look at some sort of... Um, uh, materials about women. Um, there's a really interesting translation by Julia Leslie, put by Julia okay. Leslie. Um, I think it's called the Sri Dharma Padati. Um, I don't sh actually. I'm not sure what the because it's a penguin. Um, I'm not sure what the English is, but it's by Julia Leslie, and she okay. did some really excellent work on that. That is a really good source book. Uh, um, could you just repeat uh, one more time the the first one that you mentioned, Karma Karma Sutra? Well, just the Karma Sutra, the Karma Sutra. You know what I mean? Has some interesting. Ah, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. Sorry. A, I think I think you might find the Julia Leslie's work really useful there for, for this sort of okay. earlier period. That's a good place. That's a good place to start. There's other people working on it. Um, yeah. So okay. Thank you. A comment from a viewer, Palani Muttuganapati. And he says he compliments you on the talk and he says your forthcoming book should be interesting. If it's not, and this is, I quote, if it's not out of place, I would like to inform you about how abstinence in ancient India was initiated and practiced. We know now how modern psychot psychiatry treats the alcoholics. Was it different in ancient India? It is, if it's not out of place, try to give us a glimpse. Uh, Palini ji, I think because there are eight more questions about sense, I have read it out to James and you can find him on the internet. Uh, so please take it up with him. Uh, the next question um, is, uh, the open question is, uh, um, Ra uh, Raga Santaria says, can smell be read as a phenomenon in literary usage? Um, I think so. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things that got me going with this project is that how many references to smells there were in literature and how many different ones. And I always say it's a bit like if you were studying sort of, I don't know, America now and ev everything, every type of car from a Rolls Royce to a Mini was translated into the amount hypothetical future languages, a car, a car, a car, you're like missing everything. So that's how I kind of got really um, interested in the sort of differentiation of that. So a lot of the same things apply, hot, cold, you know, agar, wood in winter. Um, the, um, what's it, the, the um, Kalidasa, what's it called again? The, uh, there's a Kalidasa poem about the uh, seasons. You see a lot of that kind of hot, cold usage in there. Ritu Samhara or Ritu Samhara? 
Yes, this, there is a Sanhara. Yeah, yeah, Sanhara. And, um, but the other thing to bear in mind about that is the way it functions is you've got to think of the bee and the flower. It's like nice fragrance. I go to this. Uh, it's not about memory. You'll sometimes see it uh, mentioned in connection to memory, but basically, and obviously, like, Karma, you know, Karma Deva is, you know, memory. But, um, but basically, mostly it works by attracting people from A to B, or the scent from so and so blows to me and makes me long for them even more. But it's about sort of spatial distance and connection, or sort of reminding me of the distance. It's not about time, it's about space in literature. Sanchita has a short question which reminds me of Body Shop. So, Sanchita, please ask your question. Unmute uh, to speak. And while she's doing that, I will look for Gita Varghis. Gita, um, I, okay, let me ask Sanchita's question. Was tea tree oil used traditionally? If so, which tree? <laughs> tea tree? Well, tea tree is from Australia, so they didn't have that. Yes. Um, I don't think they were, that was, they were, I'm sure they were using it in Australia. That's an interesting thing. It's sort of indigenous Australian sort of olfactory culture. Um, one of these neglected topics. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, like, no, I mean, typically these weren't made into distilled oils in the very early period. It was a paste, which, um, which is kind of like a nice thing in a way, because the thing is with an oil is you make your essential oil and then you've got to dilute it again to use it. So yeah. you, it, it's too strong. But if you're actually just sort of using sandalwood as is, you know, it's kind of good to go. Um, what are your favorite uh, scents? We have one last question from Geeta while Raghu brings her up. I want to ask you, what's your go-to fragrance? What do you like? Uh, like a raw ingredient or a sort of mixed one? or Both, a bit of both. Uh, uh, raw ingredients, I like, I like a really good sandalwood. Um, I feel like I should be into oud. I've got some really good oud oil, but it's like, it's kind of very rich. I like beautiful, high quality sandalwood or sandalwood. Um, I like a good oud incense. It's a, not just pure oud though, blended with camphor and sandalwood and other things. I like, I like a good rose, a good rose. It's good. And then in terms of like go-to scents to wear, um, I feel like I had a phase of being into all sorts of things, but now I tend to be where, I mean, I most commonly wear this one by Caron, by called Poor and On, like Poor A Man, Poor and On by Caron common one I wear. It's, just, it's kind of cool. It's vanilla and lavender, which is a kind of weird yeah. combination. Yeah. yeah, that's a kind of nice. So it's four. Gita, can you ask your question? This is the last yes. one. Yeah. Thank you for a very interesting session. Uh, I was just wondering whether climate, does it have an influence on preference of sense? Like people in colder climates preferring light sense, while those in tropical climates would prefer heavier sense, you know? Uh, does it have anything to do with the climate of a place? Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. I mean, yeah, I think that ties into all these other things as well, like, you know, uh, in different climates, it's not just, you know, it's, in many ways, it, different things grow. It's hot, you're, you want to be cooled down. Um, you might have more skin exposed. Um, and also you might be, you know, say, if you're sort of thinking sort of medieval Norway, you'd be in this, you'd be sort of enclosed in this house with like a fire burning, as opposed to sort of out and about. And, uh, and also in terms of things like the seasons and whether you can have flowers all year round. So I think it probably, in, in, com in various complicated ways, I think it does on those lines. And uh, if I may add, Gita, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, if you are from Kerala, like I am, um, uh, I asked my dad, why do we eat the mangoes which are considered heating and why do they show up in the summer, which is also hot? And he used a Sanskrit phrase, which was something like ushnena ushnam. Um, the heat is, uh, summer is made uh, balanced by heat. So I imagine uh, Arabs and Indians, we like heavy perfumes. So you would think because we are tropical, we would like uh, very subtle and light perfumes. But it seems like temperate people like temperate perfumes and tropical people just revel yeah, in them. That's what it's, so it's yeah. like, all these are heavy perfumes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. very much. And the, you know, the, gar the jasmine garlands, just a, just a little one in someone's hair is an incredible thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. The whole heating, cooling thing, the whole sandalwood's cooling, roses cooling, vetiver's cooling. Yeah. As you know, that's still 
very alive in India. So the whole sort of use of sense to yeah, deal with the climate, um, for better or worse, is still a it's always been a thing. And it's still Travels, yeah, in India, and we'll end with this, uh, James. My, I haven't been up north as much as I would like to, but Kerala seems to be a place where you know they use vetiver in the water, and they use. Uh, so in South India, I think Karnataka holds sandalwood dear to heart, uh, which is an interesting state for all of us lovers of sense to visit in your travels in India. And I understand you haven't been everywhere, but I'm just curious. Um, yeah, that's a good point. I feel like in the south, you will get, you know, you'll get more garland oh. usage. And you'll get, in the south, generally in the south, you'll get more garland usage and you will get, um, you know, you'll get more of these temples that have like these, same to, some would like Tirupati, but other ones, you know, you'll have these, you'll have a lot of preparation uh, on a very big scale of aromatic things. But then in the north, you know, you've got, you've got a, probably a more highly developed Itur tradition. Um, Kanoj is the um, sort of capital of production of that kind of material. Um, but any, any, you know, like, um, you know, like Delhi, you've got some really famous, real old perfumers make really good products as well. And they sell other things. That's the thing that itter, itter sellers don't just do itters. They'll often have, if you ask, they'll have agar wood. They'll have all sorts of other um, basic aromatic materials if you ask them. So, um, yeah, kind of, I mean, everywhere is kind of really interesting in its own way. And um, there's, yeah, again, there's a lot of work to be done there with kind of, I don't know, sort of like, say, many regions. And uh, like I said, I feel like, Tam I feel like Tamil, Tamil scent would be really good or anywhere in the South. Yeah. Tamil and then Kanoj, where I have to visit. Um, any yeah. last words before my last question, which is where do you go for good roses? Which, which country? Uh, do you go for good roses? Um, I mean, you get great roses in India. You get great, uh, really good roses in India, and really good rose oils as well. And they're they're used in commerce as well. Like the oils are used. Um, I mean, Bulgaria is famous for its rose oil, obviously. Um, North Africa is famous for rose. France is as good as rose oil, rose oil really. So um, yeah, I mean, like there's a lot of good places for rose. Um, it's kind of got a big distribution in fact. They do really well in England, and they do really well in Southern California as well. So um, yeah. Last words, James, before we say. Uh, um, no, nothing to add really. But thank you all for um, you know coming to listen and great questions and great comments and thank you above all for Shoba for. Um, inviting me and for a great presentation and brilliant questions and comments. Uh, this has been, I don't know, it's been really enjoyable and good to share this. It's, it's just like really nice to share this with some interested people. Yeah. I think we all basked in the perfume of your book and uh, the questions were wonderful. So thank yeah. you for all the questions and thank you, James. So you can go have your coffee now. <laughs> <laughs> And go out, go, go and smell things. There's all sorts of, you know, go and buy a garland, you know, go to an itter wallow and buy something. Thanks. And ask what they got, the, the Astley itters, you know what I mean? But go, go, make an effort, go and, there's, there's a whole, whenever I'm in India, there's so many wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, if, you, if you're there, you can go and experience that. There's a book called Go Kiss the World. You, we can say go smell the world or go smell India. <laughs> we, okay, thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Do I leave? Yeah.